this message today is enduring to the end. Enduring to the end. I want to, to encourage you today, and I want to share with you through the scripture what God's doing in your life and how you can fortify yourself to endure to the end. Hebrews 12, 25 says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Moses spoke from earth, yet weightier words from Jesus have come, words from heaven. It says, God has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. We are warned not to turn away from his voice. Verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he is promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. The author of Hebrews is saying that the same voice that shook Sinai is going to speak again. But he's not just going to shake one mountain, but he's going to shake everything that can be shaken. Everything in this current era of time that is not planted from heaven, but man-made is going to be shaken to its foundation and crumble into dust. But everything that is born of God and built by God is going to remain. It's going to stand the shaking. The harvest of the golden wheat will be gathered into his heavenly barn to be planted in a new heaven and a new earth. This isn't our final home, guys. If you're a child of God, then you are a kernel of wheat. You are a heavenly planting. You are born from above, and God's going to preserve you and take you out of this world that is dying and perishing and crumbling and he's going to plant you in a new heavens and a new earth to reign with him in glory (laughs) hallelujah nothing that is God's will be lost in the great and final shaking of all things everything not from God will be shaken and uprooted Matthew 15 13 but Jesus answered and said every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted, shall be rooted up. Every plant that is not planted by my Father will be rooted up, pulled up by the roots. Haggai 2, 6 and 7 is where the author of Hebrews drew those verses we just read. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Haggai prophesied of a shaking of all nations before Jesus, the desire of all nations, returns. We're we're seeing that, aren't we? I believe we're beginning to see the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of birth pangs. Haggai 2.21, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. God says, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne or the authority of kingdoms. What is this great shaking that God's going to do in the earth? He's shaking everything that's not from heaven. He's shaking the kingdoms of men. He's shaking every authority that says, I don't want the rule of heaven. We're going to rule our way. We're going to do it our way. He's going to overthrow the throne or the authority of kingdoms. And he says he's going to do it by turning every brother's sword, everyone's sword against his brother. There's going to be an enmity in the last days. There's going to be a a lack of peace. Look at what 
it says in Matthew 24, 6, Jesus said, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, great shakings. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. There's going to be this turning against brother against brother, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And then there's going to be a turning against the church, against believers in Jesus Christ. And look what it says. Verse 10. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Offenses and hatred will define the days before Jesus returns. Hatred and unforgiveness will be ubiquitous. It will be everywhere in the earth. Matthew 24, 13. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. God is going to take peace from the earth by the rider on the red horse who carries a great sword. Even blood brothers are going to turn against each other with hatred strong enough to kill. This is where the church must endure because peace will never be removed from the church as long as she has the spirit of peace. As long as we have the Holy Spirit, we are going to be led by a spirit that is not of this world. The spirit of forgiveness but this will require a persevering love in us to walk in the spirit and not give in to the spirit of offense we have a spirit from another world his thoughts are not our thoughts he declares forgiveness for our enemies and for those that hate us he he dra- he goes into the lower parts right where we think we've forgiven he goes into the deep parts of our heart He searches the inward parts of the belly by his spirit. And he's looking for things that are not like him. Things that have to go for his kingdom to be established in us. Consider that God is going to shake everything that can be shaken. Not only the throne of kingdoms, but all things great and small. Nothing born or built by anything other than his voice will stand. Everything will be shaken and only what is from his breath, his voice, his spirit will stand the shaking. How we need to listen to his voice and to be certain that we are found in him in this hour. Aren't you glad the kingdom of God is impervious to the shaking? That it can't be shaken? That it's immovable? I am. It says, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Grace is what's going to enable you to serve God the way he wants you to serve him, to serve him with a tender heart, to serve him with a humble heart, to recognize when he's correcting you and to respond to it. How do we get more grace so we can serve God acceptably even in the midst of a great shaking? He gives grace to who? The humble. He gives grace to the humble. Get lower to get more grace. Get lower if you need more grace. While God is shaking the kingdoms of men, he's doing a different work in his kingdom in the hearts of men, in the hearts of women. Look at verse 29. For our God is a consuming fire. What is God going to burn up? Look at Matthew 3.12. John the Baptist said this. Speaking of Jesus, he said, his winnowing fan is in his hand. Or his threshing fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. As Jesus is preparing to gather his wheat into the barn, that's us, he is winnowing them. He's winnowing us. He's separating everything useless from us. The chaff is the stalk or the sheaf that that holds the wheat until it's ripe. But chaff has no value after the wheat matures. When the precious grain is shaken from the husk, the wheat kernel is perfectly preserved. Only the chaff is taken away to be burned. 
The life of God is carefully protected. We do not need to be afraid of the winnowing fan in Jesus' hand that separates the wheat and the chaff. Only the useless will be removed so that the eternal remains. A master sculptor, think of a man who's a master at sculpting marble. A master sculptor strikes precisely to remove only what hides the masterpiece beneath the rough rock. The pressure he applies to the hammer and the chisel is never too great to harm the finished work. We need not fear the fan or the chisel as Jesus is bringing many sons and daughters to glory. Jesus is preparing his bride with a winnowing fan and it's called chastening. Luke 6.40, Jesus said, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. Did you know that that's the goal of God in Jesus Christ is to train us to be like him? It's to form us and fashion us into his image. He wants to see his son in us. And a disciple that's fully trained will be like their teacher. They'll be like Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus trains us with discipline to conform us to be like him. A human father chastens, disciplines his son to make him like himself in character and in responsibility. I'm not try- I didn't, have not tried to make my sons just like me. They, they have their own unique personality. But I have tried to train them and discipline them to be like me in areas of discipline and responsibility and love for God. While God is shaking this world, he is chastening the church. He is purging and pruning her so that she is holy and fruitful, bringing him great joy and glory. What is chastening? Some of your Bibles use the word discipline. Chastening is this. It's the whole training and education of children, which relates to the cultivation of mind and morals and employs for this purpose commands and admonitions, reproof and punishment. It also includes the training and care of the body. And it is also defined as whatever in adults cultivates the soul, the soul especially by correcting mistakes and curbing passions. It is instruction which aims at increasing virtue. The chastening of God is both instructive, in other words, it adds to us, and it's also corrective. It takes away, it prunes, it cuts away what is useless. John 15, 1 through 6. Jesus said, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener or the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Pruning is cutting away that which hinders growth. Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. He's saying, I've already pruned you. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. What prunes you? How does the Father prune you? How does he cut away branches that, are, that need to be cut away? By the word. Right now, you're being pruned. You're being trained by the word of God. That's what the Holy Spirit does with his word. We're already clean by his word. We've received it, but there's a continual pruning. You know, I think, I think of a branch. It says, we're the branches, right? But how, can you imagine a branch that has a mouth and has a hand? That the branch, when the, when, the, when the gardener comes to prune, it says, hey, wait, 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 no, not, not that branch. That's a good branch. It's a beautiful branch. Look at how it flows over here and there's leaves on it. Not that branch, Lord. And then it has a hand or, or another little branch. And, and the gardener, the father, goes to prune it with a word, with a word of correction. And all of a sudden, the little branch pushes it away. No, 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 not, not that branch. Well, that's us. 
We are branches, but we have a mouth and, and we have a hand and, and we have a will. And when the, when the Holy Spirit brings his word and wants to start pruning, we can speak up and say, no, Lord. We can push it away. No, not that branch. That's a lovely branch. I really like this branch. Look at how it creates symmetry for the whole thing. Jesus said in verse 4, abide in me. Remain in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm cutting off things that hinder life in you. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm cutting off things that hinder life in you. Endure the process and don't cut yourself off by turning from me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Without our connection to Christ by faith, we can do nothing. But trusting him through the pruning will bear much fruit. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire. And they are burned. Let's not be among those who hear his pruning word and turn away in discouragement and unbelief but those who strengthen our connection to the vine. I believe there are people, there's three groups of people when it comes to pruning. There's the first group that says, oh, this is hard. I didn't expect this. This is painful. And they actually disconnect. They walk away from their faith in Christ. That's, that's the last branch that he talks about, right? If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered. They gather them and throw them into the fire and they're burned. And then there's the branch that says, yes, Lord. You might say no at first, but as the Holy Spirit speaks to you, you say, yes, Lord. I know you're right. I know this needs to be trimmed. Do what you need to do. Cut what you need to cut. Yes, Lord. Those go on to be fruitful. And then there's the third group, which I described, which is we're a branch with a mouth and a hand. And we say, yes, Lord, to some things, and we say, no, Lord, to other things. Don't, don't cut that branch. I, I like that branch and aren't we doing good enough to leave that branch? And those branches is the majority of the church. Those branches are the ones that don't bring forth fruit. Do you understand what I'm saying? God is saying, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to be fully fruitful. I want you to fulfill my complete plan for your life. I'm not saying no to me in anything. I want to preach to you a passage that has the power to give us endurance to the end. Jesus said, he that endures to the end will be saved. If we receive these truths and act on them, we will never fall and we will stand when the world is shaken. Hebrews 12, we're going to look at some verses here, starting in verse 1. If you're a note taker, this is a great time to take some notes. I'm going to give you five things that will keep you that will keep you enduring to the end. Verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Remember Hebrews 11? The chapter of all the heroes of the faith and all the great things that they did. They subdued kingdoms, kingdoms shut the mouths of lions, escaped the edge of the sword. Did all these great things, received their dead back to life again. It's like, yes. And he's like, they're cheering you on. He says, but don't just think you can sit there and, and now you just receive Christ and you just do nothing. And they're just cheering and you're like, oh, thanks. It's great to see you cheering. I'm going to get the same reward as you. No. God calls us to something to endure, to endure and to receive the same blessings and strength that they received. Look at, look at what it says. We're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us, here's number one. Let us what? Lay aside. Lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with what? Endurance, the race that is set before us. This is where enduring in Jesus begins. This is the beginning of the race, guys. We must obey the word and the voice of the Spirit to lay aside everything that hinders us from running this marathon of faith. 
Get it in your thinking that laying aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us is not optional, but it is essential to finish your race. If you think that you can make peace with sin and weights and endure in your faith to the end, you are deceived and you're already disqualified. You've got to get a mindset that I have to lay aside every weight and every sin that the scripture reveals, that the Holy Spirit lays on my heart. I'm not going to be a branch saying, no, 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 Lord, not that one. That's good. No, God, I'm not going to tell you what to do. You are almighty God. You know what needs to be pruned in my life. So the first thing, lay aside. Lay aside every weight and the sin. Let the Holy Spirit show you what those are. Respond, say, Lord, help me to be obedient to you, to lay these things aside. Number two, verse two, looking unto Jesus. Here's the second thing. Look unto Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We are to run this difficult race with our eyes on Jesus. He endured the cross and the shame of this world because he joyfully believed his work was not in vain. His sufferings would bring many sons and daughters to glory. He endured. Look to Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Behold him. Behold him. We, we get our eyes on ourselves. We get our eyes on our circumstances. Look to Jesus. Keep looking back to Jesus. He's the one who started your faith. He's the one that's going to walk you through all the way to the finish line. He's going to teach you how to run. He's going to give you the strength that you need. Looking unto Jesus. Hallelujah. Number three is verse three. Consider him. Consider him. What are we to consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. The cure for weariness and discouragement in your soul is found right here. In fact, the cure for depression for many is found right here. It's not in a pill. It's not in a counseling session. It's right here. Listen. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself for you. Have you begun to complain about your load and the difficulty of your life as a Christian? Consider him. Comparing your difficulties to his sufferings will cure you. Amen. It will cure you of self-pity. It will cure you of, of dis being disheartened. Considering what he has suffered you will deliver you and lift you back into joy. I want to tell you just a brief story. Uh, last Sunday after I preached, I don't know, it just hit me. I just, this discouragement came over me. And I went home and I took a nap, which isn't unusual. I think it's okay to rest on Sundays. I took a nap, but then I just kind of laid in bed. I looked at some videos about war and just in do documentaries, and I just laid in bed till like 5.30. And I, I want to be honest with you. I didn't want to come to prayer meeting. In fact, I didn't want to be around anybody. I just wanted to be alone. But I knew that telling my wife I was sick and couldn't go to prayer meeting would be a lie. And I couldn't do that. So I knew I needed to go to prayer meeting. And I didn't even, you don't really realize why you're discouraged, why you're disheartened. But I was just, I sat out there before prayer meeting and I was just thinking and I'm like, Lord, is it worth it? What I'm doing, my, my labor for the church, is it making any difference? Am I even effective? I think that, is, isn't this, is this in vain? I was starting to fall into this discouragement, this depression, and this self-pity. And I came in and I sat down. It was a very small prayer meeting. And uh, Brother Tony just said, can I, can I read something to start? And I said, yeah. And he said, can I read Isaiah 53? And I said, yeah. And as he read Isaiah 53, I began to consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. I began to read how he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. How he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The 
chastisement of my peace was upon him and by his stripes I was I'm healed. And how it pleased the Lord to bruise him and put him to grief to make his soul an offering for sin and the promise that he would see his seed. He would see the joy that he suffered for, which was you and me. I began to consider him who endured such sufferings in light of my labor and sufferings, and I began to repent. Right there. I saw the beauty of Jesus and his willingness to suffer for me, and I saw my life and what I've offered for him as so tiny, and that I would complain. That I would complain, that I would get in self-pity. And you know what? I repented, and immediately that heaviness left me. Immediately that self-pity left me. Immediately I was lifted up into joy considering him who suffered such hostility against himself. My friends, your life may be hard. You may be going through some stuff. But I encourage you, consider him. Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds and become discouraged in your souls. Consider him. Consider what he's done for us. Hallelujah. Hebrews 12, 4. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. That goes to me to, to point number one. Lay aside everything. Lay aside every weight and every sin. And if need be, resist sin to bloodshed. In other words, resist it to the point where you would lose your life in resisting it. Verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, here's the fourth thing. Do not despise the chastening of the Lord. To despise his chastening is to say whatever when he corrects you. Whatever. It's not that serious, whatever he's saying. I'm doing pretty good. Don't despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't take his correction lightly. Don't do this. Don't put your hand up to stop the pruning. You're only hindering your future usefulness and fruitfulness. Listen, many Christians wonder why God doesn't use them more. They've learned so much. They've grown so much in the deeper things of God in their, in their learning. And yet, why isn't God using them? Listen, could it be that they're saying to God when he puts his finger on something in their heart, some branch that needs to be pruned, an unteachable spirit, some pride, some arrogance, and they say, oh, no, no, not that, God. They despise his chastening, and they refuse to let him prune them. Pruning is so that we can be useful, be fruitful. Here's the fifth one. Nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. Don't be discouraged when he corrects you, even if it's a strong rebuke. Don't be discouraged. Rejoice instead because this means that you are loved and you are his true child. Look at verse 6. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Besides the free grace that has made us accepted in the beloved, another proof that we are loved and accepted is his correction. It's his pruning. Do you ever wonder, am I really loved by God? Well, look at, examine your life. First examine the cross, that's the greatest testimony that you're loved. But then examine your life and say, am I pruned? Am I corrected? Has the Lord rebuked me? When I read his word, when I hear a sermon, do I, do I say, well, that's for somebody else, not for me? Well, you might not be his child if you constantly say that. But if you say, oh God, I'm the one standing in need. I see this is for me. You have cut me, and I want to respond to you. Rejoice. Rejoice, because that means God loves you. You're his true child, his true son, his true daughter. Rejoice. My son might say to me, Papa, why do all the kids at school get to do this and that, and I don't? Because you're my son. They're not my sons. I'm not their father. They can do what they want. Why are you restricted? 
Why, why, Dad, am I restricted? And they're not because you're my son, because I love you, because I'm shaping your life. I'm training your life so that you will become an honorable son. God doesn't chasten those that are not his own sons. And neither do we. Right? It'd be wrong if some man brought his child into this church and I started trying to parent them. He'd be like, what are you doing? This is my son. I don't parent other people's children. I parent mine. God parents and chastens his children. Hallelujah. Verse 7. I said five things. There's actually six. Here's the final thing. If you endure chastening. Here's the last thing. Endure chastening. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening or discipline of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons, not true sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed are the human fathers for a few days disciplined us as seemed best to them. But he... For our profit, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. God chastens us for our profit to make us holy as he is holy. Verse 11, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. Pain from God's chastening is not condemnation, nor is it rejection. It's what we must endure to be overcomers in the end. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. The painful cutting produces bountiful fruit in those who've been trained by it. To be trained by it is to yield to it. It's not to say, whatever, or I'm discouraged, God, you rebuked me. Do you know what most of us do when we're corrected? I, I was going to do it, but I, I just lost the courage to do it. I was going to fall on the ground and, and act like a baby having a fit on the floor. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. My wife says, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> but isn't that true? Everything is fine in church world and grand until someone corrects us. Someone sees something in our life and, and mentions it. And it's an area God wants to prune. And we go, Wah! My son was waiting for that. We, we throw ourselves on the ground and we have a fit. That's not, that's not being trained. That's not enduring. We should say, Lord, what are you saying to me? Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Praise God. There's going to be painful cutting, but it will produce a bountiful harvest in those who've been trained by it. Those who've said yes. Those who haven't mouthed off to God and put their hand up, those who say, God, do what you need to do. The fully trained disciple will look like the teacher and bear his fruit. This call is to endure the pain of God's chastening, knowing that the joy will far outweigh the suffering. Verse 12, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Strengthen the discouraged ones in the race. And make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame or can't walk may not be dislocated, but rather healed. There are some healings of the heart that can only come by yielding to his chastening. You know, not all healing comes from a prayer and just God just touches you and heals you. Some healing comes through chastening, through discipline, through yielding to the word of God. Some people can live in the church for years and years, never healed. And it's not because God's power can't heal them. And I'm not talking about physical healing. I'm talking about heart healing. It's not because God's spirit can't heal them. It's that they are resisting his chastening. 1 Peter 5.10, great encouraging verse. Listen, speaking of suffering and the pain of chastening, after you, I'm reading this out of the ESV, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, 
who has called you to his eternal glory, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Glory to the God of all grace. Your suffering is only for a little while. I know it may seem like this cutting is never going to end, like this pain is never going to end, but it's only for a little while. There's an after, there's an afterwards where he is going to himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Glory to God. What does establish mean? It means making you unshakable. That when the world around you is shaking, you are not shaken. You've been chastened, you've endured it, and God has established you. Praise God. Praise God. Pruning, his pruning, yielding to it, establishes you. I want to close with a few verses from Psalms to encourage you. That though the Lord is going to shake the nations, shake the world, his people are not going to be shaken. We have a strong foundation. Psalm 46, 1, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake, with its swelling. Remember, he's going to shake all things. Though the mountains shake with its swelling. Verse 4. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. Listen. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. Other translations say, she shall not be shaken. God will help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. All these things shaking is by the hand of God. Nations rising against nations by the hand of God. War By the hand of God, but listen, listen, his end, verse 9. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two, and he burns the chariot in the fire. In the end, God is going to bring peace. He's going to destroy all the weapons of war. He's going to destroy all the people that want war, and it's going to be peace in the earth. He's going to make the wars cease. Look at verse 10. Be still. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Praise God. Be still. Know that he's God. Know that he's working in your life. Psalm 16, 8. A few verses in closing. Three psalms. I have set the Lord always before me. Remember looking unto Jesus. Considering Jesus. The psalmist said, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Glory to God. Aren't you you glad today that though everything is going to be shaken, you standing in him as a new creature in Christ, yielding to him, you are not going to be shaken. Why? Because he's at your right hand. Because he's with you. Psalm 21, 7, out of the New American Standard. For the king trusts in the Lord. And through the loving kindness of the Most High, he will not be shaken. What else is upholding you that you're not shaken? The loving kindness of the Lord. That when your foot starts to go the wrong way or starts to tremble, he stabilizes you by his loving kindness. Psalm 62, 6. He only or alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. Glory to God. Praise God. Praise the Lord.